Amen. Well, good morning, Flipside. I will add my happy Father's Day to those that have already been extended. It's a good day to be in church. I'm glad you're here. Uh, can I share some father stats with you guys? Some Father's Day statistics. Uh, this is in no way an attempt to um, diminish or discount the impact mothers have on the faith development of kids, especially the single moms that are towing the line or maybe grandparents. This is just uh, some interesting data on how big of a deal uh, a father is in the life of kids, but especially in the faith uh, development, the faith formation of kids. Data collected by Promise Keepers and Baptist Press. If a father does not go to church, even if his wife does, only one in five children will become regular, regular church worshipers. If a father does go regularly, regardless of what the mother does, between two-thirds and three-quarters of their children will attend church as adults. <clears throat> if a father attends church irregularly, between one-half and two-thirds of their kids will attend church with some regularity as adults. If a mother does not go to church but, the, but a father does, a minimum of two-thirds of their children will end up attending church. In contrast, if a father does not go to church, but the mother does, on average, two-thirds of their children will not attend church. Interesting data. Again, not, not an attempt to, to diminish the impact mothers have, but just to call to attention um, the fact that a dad's impact on the lives of his kids, especially faith formation and things of a spiritual nature, um, have, a, have a huge impact. They make a huge difference. Um, so if you're a dad here today, happy Father's Day and good for you for being here. I want to encourage you with that because like Sean said, that a lot of times goes overlooked or completely unlooked at. And I also want to encourage you, if you know a dad, encourage them to come to church, to bring their families to church. It's a good place to be. My name is Jeff. If we have not met before, I'm the executive pastor here at Flipside. Pastor Carl is away out of the state enjoying some much-needed R&R with his family, so so glad that uh, we can be a church that allows our senior pastor to do that. It's a good, good thing. But in the meantime, we get to share some time together with each other here today. I'm excited about this message. Um, I'm hoping you'll be encouraged by it. It's been about 10 chapters since we've met. We got together back in chapter 7 and talked about some really cool things back then, and here we are again today in chapter 17. But back in chapter 7, um, I encouraged you all to, whenever you come across anything of any substance, anything, anything that's profound, anything that somebody tells you, hey, you need to give this a look, you need to give this some time, one of the first questions, if not the first question we ask, should be why? Why? Why would anybody go through the trouble to make it, to be part of it, to write it down, and why should I even devote any amount of my time to it? Through the pen of John, God preemptively addresses that question that he knew we would have. Why? Why should I and why would you, we say to God? He answers that question. He answers that why question. He says, I've written these things so that you may believe. So often we pray for things to be a certain way. We pray for people to change. We pray for situations to change, for people to act one way or another. One of the things I started doing about two years ago, which I'm kind of ashamed to admit it was as recently as two years ago, uh, considering the amount of time I've been coming to church, um, is I started praying for people's hearts to be moved, people's hearts to be changed. And that is a dangerous prayer. Because when you pray, God, I just pray that hearts would be changed. God says, all right, guess who we're going to start with? And that's a dangerous prayer. God says, all right, you want to change some hearts? How about we start with yours? Because a lot of times they're like, no, I didn't mean me. I meant them. And God says, no, I mean you. That's where we're going to start. I think if we're honest, we would admit that when the bullets start flying. You know, the situations go down. It's not 72 and fluorescent on a Sunday morning when we're in church. It's where you find yourself on a Wednesday or a Tuesday morning or maybe on a Thursday afternoon 
When those crisis situations come around, I would think we would admit, if we're being completely honest, the last thing we're concerned about is hearts. I don't care about their heart. I want stuff to get done. If you have junior hires or you've had junior hires in your house, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You're like, I do not care about their heart. I want them to stop being a knucklehead. I want them to do the chores I asked them to do. I want, them to, st- I want to see stop, stop seeing red marks and Aries and then get their stuff together. I don't care about their heart. But God says, the Bible says, this idea of belief, the idea, the idea not necessarily of behavior modification, but the idea of belief, our heart state, is the difference maker. It's been interesting. Um, if you're not aware, you belong to a church that offers you a free Ramsey Plus. If you've ever heard of Financial Peace University, free Ramsey Plus membership. And it's been so cool taking families, individuals, couples, through this Financial Peace University curriculum. It's life-changing for many of them. I just started doing it with my brother and his wife. They live in Colorado, and so it doesn't even matter if you're physically here. Um, But one of the things as I've taken couples and taken people through through that program is when they start to believe they can, game over. And you can almost see it in their eyes. You can like, it's it's like the eye of the tiger. When you know they can believe they can get out of debt, when you know that they believe they can pay off their mortgage, the rest is almost just like implementation. It's just the details. It's how it fleshes out. That belief makes all the difference. Henry Ford said, whether you believe you can do a thing or not, guess what? You're right. If you believe you can do it, you're right. If you don't think, if you don't believe you can do it, you're right. You can't. Now, there are some limitations here. At one point, I think it was during my junior year in high school, I could dunk a basketball. So awesome. To think that I could jump that high is just ridiculous. I can't just wake up one morning, now that I'm 50-something, and just believe that I'm going to dunk a basketball. Those days are over. But when it comes to these God-ordained and God-orchestrated and God-willed things in our lives, belief can make all the difference. So that's why we've titled this series, That You May Believe. It's coming in chapter 20, second to last chapter of Book of John. But it's a good reminder for for us here this morning. Last week, Pastor Carl, if you were here, you heard him talk about, he gave a fantastic message on John chapter 16, where Jesus was talking about some things that were going to happen. It's interesting, I had a discussion with one of my friends this past week, and I said, When Jesus says something is going to happen, you can pretty much take it to the bank. If Jesus says it's going to happen, it's pretty much a lock. There used to be a joke, especially in youth ministry a few years ago. We would say, there's what you have planned, and then there's what happens. And sometimes it's almost like you luck out, and those things line up, those two things line up. But more often than not, there's what you have planned, and then there's what happens. For instance, a couple winters ago, we planned on taking about 15 kids uh, up to winter camp to play in the snow for a couple days. Instead, we took about three times that many and almost got killed by the snow. So there was what we had planned, and then there's what happened. And I used to say something in youth ministry all the time. I'd, I'd say, all right, guys, here's what's going to happen. I stopped saying that because there's what I have planned that's going to happen, and then there's what actually happens. But when Jesus says something's going to happen, we can pretty much take it to the bank. And so in chapter 16, he talked about some things that were going to happen in his life, some things that were going to happen in the lives of the disciples. And to be honest, much of it had some pretty negative connotations. Stuff about them being ostracized, stuff about them being disowned, thrown out of the synagogue, about how they would weep and mourn while the world rejoices Stuff about how Jesus is going to go away, but he's going to send a counselor. And what does that even mean? And then at the end of chapter 16, the disciples, they sort of give this half-hearted amen, this half-hearted response. At the end of chapter 16, they say to Jesus, now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. This is basically the disciples giving it, giving it a go. They're giving it some effort. And Jesus, in response to this statement from the disciples, says one of the most honest statements ever uttered about the human condition. 
This verse, I keep coming back to this verse all the time. But before he does, he comes back and he addresses the question, why? Jesus was always doing this. He was always, it's like, it's like a response to that little toddler who just asks why all the time. Jesus is always addressing that why. In chapter 15, he says, I've told you this so that my, my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. At the beginning of chapter 16, he says, I, th- all this I have told you so that you will not fall away. And then three verses later in, in verse four, he says, I've told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember. And then in response to their statement here at the end of chapter 16, he says, I've told you these things so that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have what? Trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Amen to that. I went, do you guys know what TED Talks are? You know what TED Talks are? If you don't know what a TED Talk is, ask somebody next to you who just nodded their head and they'll tell you what a TED Talk is. I went back and I listened to one of my favorite TED Talks where this person is talking about the top three aspects or the top three things that a resilient person has, the the top three character traits that a resilient person possesses. Some people call it grit. The number one character trait of resilient people is this right here. They understand that in this world, you will have trouble. They just get that. And they live according to that understanding. They're like, stuff happens. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble, but don't lament that. Don't have a pity party. Don't wallow in that. Take heart. I've overcome the world. Next week in chapter 18, I really want you guys to be here next week because in chapter 18, things are really gonna take off. If you like action movies, chapter 18 starts the the, the action-packed part of the gospel of John. But before we get to chapter 18, we get this glimpse, this pause, that is the entirety of chapter 17. And this is only recorded in John's gospel. You go to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you can't find this account in those gospels. Chapter 17 has been called the true Lord's Prayer. Many people say it's Mark, uh, sorry, Matthew chapter six, where Jesus says, uh, he, our father who art in heaven. When I used to say that prayer when I was a kid, I used a bunch of old English words that I never used any other time, but when I said that prayer. Many people think that's the Lord's Prayer. That's not, that's actually Jesus teaching his disciples how to pray. But here in chapter 17, before things really get heated up and get moving, we get this glimpse, we get this front row seat in one of the most intimate conversations Jesus has with his father. So in chapter 17, verse one, it starts off like this. If you brought your Bibles with you, if you pull them up on your phone, however you read the word, pull that up. We're gonna start right there in verse one. After Jesus said this, after Jesus said what? Well, the things we just talked about, about how you're gonna have trouble in this world. He looked toward heaven and he prayed, Father, the hour has come. Now, if you were one of the disciples, this should have really grabbed your attention. If you were one of the disciples, you really wanted to to hear this. And this is one of those situations where if you've ever been in a situation and you're like, hold on a minute, did you you just hear what he said? Was Was I hearing things? We've had this joke in my family for a while. My my kids kind of make fun of me because when I chew anything that's more of more substance than oatmeal, I have these large resonating sinuses and I can't hear anything when I'm chewing. And so my kids will actually stop what they're saying to let, let dad finish chewing. He is not hearing us at all. So I, I kind of told you guys last time when I read scripture, I kind of imagine myself what I would do. I would not have wanted to be chewing when this happened because I would have oh, I would have missed Jesus saying, Father, the hour has come. Why was this such a big deal? Why was this such a big deal for Jesus to say, Father, the hour has come. He's not even talking to his disciples. He's talking to God. All through this gospel and many of the other gospels, Jesus has been saying, it's not time. It's like his catchphrase. He should have a shirt that says, my hour has not yet come. He says it all the time. There's a wedding in Cana where Jesus performed his first miracle. And to his mother, he says, woman, my time has not yet come. 
Back in chapter seven, when his uh, family, he was in Galilee hanging out with his family and his brothers urged him to go to Judea. He says, you guys don't know what you're talking about. My time has not yet come. And then even after he did go, they were, were told they tried to seize him, but they couldn't. Why? Because his hour had not yet come. And now he looks towards heaven and he says, Father, it's time. The hour is here. And the disciples must have been thinking, did anybody else hear that? Was I, am I hearing things? And before, so Jesus says, okay, the time has come, but before things take a turn, I want to check in with God. I want to look back at my life. I want to do an assessment with God. And when Jesus does that, it gives us a front row seat into the most honest assessment of what a, of what a life well lived looks like. It's a great thing for us to do, especially on a day like today. Jesus takes inventory of his life, and we have a front row seat to this gut check moment. So for the remainder of our time here today, we're gonna consider nine things Jesus says. Some of you are like, oh my gosh, that's a lot of things. That may be the case, but my hope is that one or two or maybe three of these is gonna stick out for you as the thing, the biggies, the, th the, the struggle of life or the, str the thing that I've been working on. And hopefully you'll get some clarity. As we hold up Jesus's idea Jesus and the Bible's idea of what a life well li lived looks like. I want us to contrast that with what our culture says a life well lived looks like. I think you're going to see some stark contrast. So as we carry on, verses one through four, after he said this, he said, Father, the hours come, glorify your son that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give them eternal life to all those you have given him. Now, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. So the first thing Jesus says about himself that he's done is he says, God, I've brought you glory. What a great thing to be able to say, no matter if you're old or young, to be able to say, God, I've brought you glory. So the question for us, who or what? Does my life or has my life glorified? If you're a parent, a great source of an honest answer for this is your kids. <laughs> Some of us are like, nope, don't ask them. There was, yeah, I could, I could go on and on on that one. If somebody were to ask my kids, Who, what is your dad? Does your dad glorify himself? Does he glorify his career? Does he glorify his hobbies? What in my life have I brought glory to you? Jesus says, God, I've brought you glory. Father, I've brought you glory. And then the second thing he says is he says, I finished the work you gave me to do. <clears throat> so the question for us, what are you working on? Not what are you working on when you go to the office or not what are you working on when you go out to the shop or the garage? What is your life's work? And is it the work God gave you to do? When Jesus looked back, he said, I finished the work you gave me to do. This was a really big deal for me about 10 years ago because I realized I had set some things up in my life that was not things God wanted me to work on. They were things I selfishly wanted to work on. And it was as though God said, you don't realize this, but you're in, you're in charge of maintaining that because that came from you. That didn't come from me. And for Jesus to say, God, I finished the work you gave me to do. There was a youth group. I've, I've been sort of, not cursed, but I have this, I would call it a gift. Let's just call it a gift. I think in vivid details about things that really are be like, just move on. And so we just started our summer youth programs a few weeks ago. And as I was helping Jared and plan these things out, I thought, well, let me go back and look at what we did last summer. And oh my gosh, I spent like hours looking at, that worked. No, can't do that again. Somebody almost died. Oh yeah, that's cool. We should go there. But one of, the, one of the youth groups we had, we talked about this uh, passage out of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. One of the junior high students said, I trust in the Lord with most of my heart. Isn't that good enough? Well, I mean, the Bible says all your heart. 
Submit to him in all your ways and he will make your path straight. Ask God, what is the work you want me to be working on, God? Not just my career, but what is my life's work about? I want it to come from you. Uh, There's some things that I gave me to work on that I realized that was really, really, that was a, a, a really narrow focus through a really narrow lens. One of the translations says, Trust in the Lord with, in all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths known. He will take what's unknown and shed light on it so that it's known. If you think it's this that you should be working on, I'm saying it's this that you should be working on. And what a great statement for Jesus to be able to say, I finished the work not society gave me to do, not my family gave me. I finished the work you gave me to do, God. Verses five through seven. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of this world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now that they know that everything, now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. So the other statement, the third statement Jesus says about himself, he says, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me. If you've put your, especially if you've put your faith in Jesus, God has put you in people's lives and put people in your life for the specific purpose of revealing him to them. Otherwise, the moment you accepted Christ, if you're a Christian, God would have just taken you home. But he's kept you here for one specific purpose, to reveal him to others. We're going to talk a little bit about how that unfolds, but this is, this is what Jesus says. I've revealed you to them. So the question for us, whoops, the tra- question for us is sort of a, digs a little deeper. Who has God given you? Who has God put in your life for the purpose of revealing him to them? Verse 8, for I gave them the words you gave me and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you and they believed that you sent me. Fourth thing Jesus says about himself, I gave them the words you gave me. When he says, I gave them the words, actually, if we go back to the Greek, this can mean one of two things. That word, it can mean one of two things. It can mean a word that's called rhema or a word that's called called logos. Here he's talking about the rhema. Well, what does that mean? The rhema refers to the word of God that's specific to the individual and pertains to the specific occasion. Jesus says, as I've been doing life with these people that that you have put in my life, Father, and whose lives you've, you've put me in, he says, as we've been doing life, I've revealed you to them based on the specific individual using the unique occasions we found ourselves in. The best, one of the best examples of this is when Jesus is passing through Samaria with James and John, the sons of thunder. And they're passing through Samaria, and they're to, we're told that the Jews hated the Samaritans. They, and James and John, they get into this altercation. They get into this tussle with some of the Samaritans. They didn't want to be there in the first place. So they're already, you know, they're just waiting for somebody to look at them wrong. They're already ready to throw down. And so these guys give them, give them a bad time. And they're like, we've got Jesus here. We can do some damage. And they want to call down fire and brimstone. And Jesus says, that's not why I came. And they're like, but they're Samaritans. Come on. He's like, that's not why I came. And he reveals God to the specific individuals based on the specific occasions that they found themselves in. So the question for us, how do I handle the unique, I should have put that in quotes, the unique individual. Some of you are like, that's a really kind way of telling the person who I'm thinking of right now, you're such a unique individual. Those unique individuals and the occasions that I find myself in in with them in life. How do I do that? Am I revealing the rhema to them? Or am I going by what my friends would say is right? How tradition, maybe some traditions would say this is how. For James and John, it was tradition. They hated the Samaritans. It was 
crystal clear to them how they should act. And Jesus says, nope, it's not how we're going to act. Verses 9 through 12, I pray for them, Jesus says, I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture may be fulfilled. So the fifth thing Jesus says he's done is he says, I've protected them and kept them safe. This is really interesting. Um, I've been to Guatemala a couple times and the first time I went, it was really interesting the preparation for that trip, I was telling my family, hey, I'm going to be gone. We're, here's where we're going, and I'm going to leave here, I'm going to leave here, and I'm going to be back then. And some very well-meaning family members pulled me aside at a barbecue, and they said, hey, I looked up where you're going. It's really dangerous. I'm like, yeah, it's going to be awesome. I'm like, no, I don't think you should go. I, you know, because they're family members, I'm trying to be nice. I'm like, well, we've already planned the trip and money's been paid. And, and they said, well, I'm going to pray for your protection. I said, thanks. Great. Politely thank them for that. This is not the protection Jesus is talking about here because Jesus took his disciples into some pretty sketchy situations. Yes, there was physical protection, but that's not the type of protection Jesus is talking about here. What Jesus is talking about here is protection from evil. He made sure they were protected from the influences of the evil one. On one occasion, Jesus tells Peter, Peter? Because Peter was always making these really bold statements. He was always just like saying things and then letting his brain catch up with his mouth. And a lot of times it really didn't work out for him. And so he, he's just made this really bold statement about following Jesus everywhere or anywhere. And Jesus tells Peter, Peter, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. And the, the word you is like an all y'all. It's Peter who mouthed off, but Jesus is like, Peter, Satan has asked to sift all y'all like wheat. Basically saying, your name came up in a conversation between Satan and God the other day. I never want my name to come up in a conversation between Satan and God. That's like, there's a few instances in the Bible where that happens to people, and oh, man. And Jesus tells him, your name came up, and Satan asked to sift you like wheat. In the Gospel of Luke, we're, to we're told this is the idea of something being shaken so violently that it comes apart. And Jesus tells Peter, Satan asked to shake your faith so violently that it comes apart, that your testimony and your witness would be made null and void. Satan wants to do that to not just you, Peter, but to all you guys. And Jesus says, but I've prayed for you. I've prayed that your faith would be protected, that it would not fail. Verse 13 and 14. So, well, first our question for us, are you protecting those God has given you? Physically, sure. We don't want to be naive. We don't want to be negligent. But more importantly, the protection that comes from addressing evil that they're going to be confronted with. So verses 13 and 14, Jesus says, I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word and the, word has, and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. So the sixth thing Jesus says he's done, he says, I've given them your word. Here we're back. And this time he's talking about the Logos. He's talking about the literal commands of Scripture. He says, I've given them that. The whole reason Jesus could say, I've given them the rhema, is because he was continually pointing back to the fact that he was always giving them the logos mentioned here. The problem with the culture we live in today is we want the rhema without putting time into the logos. 
We say things like, God, just tell me what I need to do to fix this. Give me your rhema. And God says, if you would have spent time with me in my logos, you would have had the rhema back then so there wouldn't be anything that needs fixed now. So the question for us, am I pointing people to the word? You hear Pastor Carl say it all the time, but the Bible, I can't do it like he does it. He gets that real, I need to shout on a, the sidelines of a football field for a while. He says, but the Bible says, right? He always, thank you. He's always pointing people back to what the Bible says. This is a really, this is so valuable if you're a new believer because you're just kind of figuring things out. Not that you ever get to a point where you figured it all out, but to bring the Bible and put the Bible where it really needs to be anyway, at the center of things, is such a liberating thing for everybody involved. I know your teacher says this, but the Bible says this. I know your brother says this, but the Bible says this. Jesus says, are we pointing? He says, I've, I've pointed them back to the Logos. And the question for us is, are we doing the same? Are, are we pointing people to the word when you're at those barbecues? Maybe you'll be at one this afternoon and you'll be able to say, I know that's what so-and-so says, or I know that's what this organization says, but I know the Bible says this. And let the Bible speak for itself. Verses 15 through 18. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Kind of what we talked about earlier. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. So Jesus says, the seventh thing he says he's done, he says, I have sent them into the world. Jesus called his disciple out of the world to transform them only to send them back into the world to be salt and light. You hear us talk about our huddle here at Flipside all the time. It's those eight to 15 people God has put in your life that you do life with. Some of them are a joy. Some of them are, some of them are an absolute exhaustion. But they're the eight to 15 people that God has put in our lives called our huddle. Have you ever heard the term a holy huddle? A lot of times we create for ourselves a holy huddle. It's those people who think exactly like we do. They act exactly like we do. They agree with everything we agree with. They think the person who should be president is the same person we think should be president. They're our holy huddle. If you're a Christian, God has sent you into the world to be part of a huddle that has people who don't think like you think, who don't act like you act. He sent you out into the world. If you're a brand new believer, sure, there may need to be some healing or some learning that needs to happen, but you're still being sent. So the question for us today, to whom has God sent me? There are some places you dread going that you have to go to on a regular basis that are just an inconvenience or a downright disturbance to you. There is a very high potential you're being sent there. This was really humbling for me about five years ago because I was really, I was belly aching about some things I had to do. And one of my friends said, so let me ask you this. If you didn't show up, would there be anybody there who believes in God? I went, crap. <sighs> Jesus says, I've sent them into the world. I, I also came to the realization recently, finally, that I'm not young anymore, kind of sucks. It's a real horrible realization to come to. Everybody around me knew it. I just didn't know it. But if you're old like me, and you've been walking any amount of time with Jesus, more than a few years, you should be asking yourself this auxiliary question, who are you sending? It's a great question for us dads to ask on Father's Day. Who are you sending? Who in my life would I call my legacy? Not just carrying on the family name, but carrying on the ways of biblical thinking, carrying on the scriptural mindsets. Who am I sending out? It's a great question to ask ourselves. Verses 19 through 22. For them I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. We could do a whole message on the meaning of sanctification my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will, who will believe in me through their message. That all of, sorry, let's go 
feedback, who believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you, have, that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. Jesus says, I have given them the glory you gave me. This is Jesus saying, I've called them to be something they are not yet being. If you're a coach, this is crucial to understand. Calling people to be something they're not yet being. God did this with people all the time. The call of Moses, Moses was running. He was hiding out in the desert and God calls him to be the deliverer of his people. And I would imagine Moses would have been like, you got the wrong dude. There's no way, I've got some past. And God says, I'm calling you to be something you're not yet. If you know the story of Gideon, Gideon is threshing wheat in a wine press, which is stupid because you need wind to thresh wheat and there's no wind in a wine press. He's cowering like a like, you know, scared little mouse in a wine press trying to thresh wheat. And God shows up and calls him a mighty warrior. And Gideon's like, wrong dude. Think you, got, you think you got your address wrong. And God says, nope, that's you. I'm calling you. I'm calling you something you're not yet. You just don't see it yet. The call of Isaiah. Isaiah says, I'm, a, I'm a, a person of unclean lips, and I come from a people of unclean lips. And God says, yeah, I'm calling you to be something you're not yet. And Jesus says, I'm, I've given them the glory you gave me. He did this with Peter. He said, Simon, you're Simon right now, but I'm, gonna, I'm calling you Peter because on you, I'm going to build my church. Here's what this is not. Young people, listen up. Here's what this is not. This is not lying to people, telling them what they want to hear. This is not a helicopter mom or a snowplow parent telling their kids, you're great at everything. You can do no wrong. You deserve a trophy participation medal or trophy for this. This is not that. This is speaking the truth into people's lives about what they're capable of through a life surrendered to God. Not an easy life, but a good life. And Jesus says, I've given them the glory you gave me. So the question for us, this is a really good question. Am I building people up with what I say to them? I remember my kids were in junior high. This seemed to be like all of seventh and eighth grade for my oldest daughter. It's like, if I called you what you were being right now, oh man, we'd have problems. I'm gonna call you something you're not right now because I know you're capable of it. You just don't see it right now. Verses 23 through 26. I and them and you and me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Wow, that kind of rhymed. That's a good line for a song right there. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you, gave, you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them, and they will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. The last thing Jesus says, and it kind of wraps back to the first thing. He says, I've made you known to them. Jesus is saying, people, because of me, people are now without excuse. Claiming ignorance is no longer an option. Jesus says, God, through me, you're now known to people. It's no mystery anymore. The apostle Paul would write about this. He says, in one of his letters, he said, he made known to us the mystery of his will. Jesus says, they now know the person. God, they know your nature. They know about your kingdom. So the question for us is this, simply, am I making God known to others? If someone were to say, I've got a lot, I went to church the last Sunday, and I got a lot of questions about God, would I be somebody, they go, let me get, let me get you to talk to so-and-so. because we've spent a life making God known to others, taking what's, what's unknown and making it known. Would I be the, for in, take for instance, so-and-so? 
So the application for this week is pretty easy. What are your biggies? What are the one, two, nine that are the biggies for you? What's the struggle? What are the ones I'm working on? My prayer is that God has called us to step up, especially here on Father's Day, and do what Jesus did in chapter 17, to take an assessment, to look back, to take inventory of how our walk is going and to be honest and to check in with God. Do we have a deal? Awesome. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the blessings of Father's Day. Thank you for the challenge of doing what Jesus did, looking back and taking inventory and saying, how am I doing? God, help us to never do these things based on our strength, but help us to look to you for guidance, wisdom, and strength to to honestly assess and to honestly confront the times where maybe um, we've fallen short. Help us to acknowledge that and to press forward in your strength. Jesus, we ask this all in your name. Amen.